most important thing is to keep moving. That way they might never catch up to you. John McNaughton has a small but varied selection of feature films. The oddball sci-fi alien film The Borrower, the Bill Murray and Robert De Niro-led Mad Dog and Glory, and the late 90s erotic thriller sleazefest Wild Things amongst a handful of TV projects. None of those, however, would be possible without the documentary filmmaker's first foray into fiction with the disturbingly real profile of life as a murderous madman in Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer. The film's script is based on the then-fresh arrest of murderer Henry Lee Lucas and his partner Otis Toole, but how close to real life did McNaughton skew with his movie? Lock your doors and check to make sure your luggage is empty as we find out what the fuck really happened to Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer. While Henry was shot over 28 days in 1985 for only about $110,000, the controversy it caused with the MPAA caused it to only have a very limited release at the 1986 Chicago Film Festival, followed by a four-year wait until January of 1990. The film would also be slapped with the dreaded X rating, which would scare away a lot of distributors. McNaughton himself sent it to critics who would give it mostly good reviews. Even Roger Ebert, who would hate a lot of horror movies through his lifetime, gave the film positive marks. This film deserves to be seen, and you know, this must be the only civilized country on earth that doesn't believe there's such a thing as an adults-only movie, a movie that is unsuitable for people under 17. According to the MPAA, there was no combination of cuts that would drop the film to an R rating, but there was talk of a non-pornographic X rating dubbed A for adults that never came to be. That rating would later become NC-17, and the film would be released very limited to a score of just north of $600,000. Pretty decent for a low-budget horror flick that nobody wanted. The film has gone on to cult status for its disturbing realism, and even received a panned sequel in 1996 simply called Henry II, Mask of Sanity. None of the cast or creators came back, and the movie has mostly forgotten the time now. Do you want to die? Michael Rooker plays the role of Henry in the first film, and while he's known for James Gunn films and The Walking Dead now, this is his masterpiece, and apparently, he stayed in character throughout the entire filming process. The real-life Henry Lee Lucas was a horrifying person, and the movie doesn't do his character any favors, but how close does it follow the real-life events? The movie opens with a handful of corpses overlaid with a rather disturbing musical score and voices of what must have happened to the victims. This is cut in with scenes of Henry, played by the chilling Michael Rooker, traveling around the city. The only time the movie even places him at one of the crime scenes is when he leaves a diner and then we see the proprietor's bodies after. What is an interesting and very intentional take on the scenes is that the voices in the background don't match up with Michael Rooker and his soft tone for the version of Henry that he's playing. Henry picks up a hitchhiker before the screen turns to black, and we never see the fate of the young woman, although Henry has the guitar she is carrying with him in the very next scene. This is where the movie shows its intentions right off the bat. While the film based some of their kills off actual crime scene photos, the entire facade that is Henry Lee Lucas is that he was known as the Confession Killer. While he was eventually convicted of 11 murders, he claimed to be responsible for an additional 600. Though throughout the remainder of his life, he would eventually deny almost all of his crimes, he routinely led the police on chases to find remains or to purported crime scenes where he would talk about the events that transpired. The movie then switches gears to our other main character in Otis, who is meeting with his younger sister Becky to take her back to his place. Otis is played by character actor great Tom Towles, and we get the less nuanced portrayal of a psychopath than Rooker's Henry. The two get to their apartment where Henry arrives shortly after, carrying the guitar from the previous scene. Where did you get that? Picked it up. It's said that he's only going to stay a little bit and intends to move on shortly. The trio goes about their day until Otis has work to attend to and Henry gets some quality time with Becky. They trade horror stories with Becky talking about the sexual abuse sustained from her father while asking Henry about how he murdered his mother. Otis tells her in the previous scene that he did it with a bat, but Henry tells her at first it was a knife and later in the conversation that it was with a gun. He killed her because she was a prostitute who would humiliate and even dress him up as a girl during her sessions with Johns. While the movie changes some of the details around to different characters, it remains pretty accurate. Becky in Otis's real life was a slightly mentally disabled niece who would eventually have a relationship with Henry. Instead of Becky getting abused, it was a young Otis who was repeatedly abused by his father who would do the act himself or loan him out to his friends. Otis in the movie is no peach, but the real one was raised with satanic cult practices in addition to the previously mentioned abuses. He would go on to claim that he would kill and eat his victims. Another deviation comes in the aspect of where the two men met. 
The film depicts the pair meeting in prison, while in real life the two met at a soup kitchen where they became fast friends and probable lovers, with Otis being a prostitute for much of his life. The confused explanation of how and when Henry killed his mother plays into the false confession angle, but in reality, real-life Henry really did commit matricide when he fatally stabbed her, claiming self-defense. The movie continues with the pair going out and finding prostitutes until Henry kills them both before explaining to Otis that the world is either us or them. Otis admits having killed before, but only in self-defense. Otis ends up breaking the TV and goes with Henry to a fence to get one on the cheap. The man insults them and is killed with stabs from a soldering iron and then with the TV smashed onto his head before it gets turned on. They take the TV and the video camera that they were shown. Otis then meets with his parole officer and realizes that there's absolutely zero suspicions from the multiple murders they have committed. He ends up selling drugs to a younger man before putting the moves on him, similar to the moves he tries to make towards his younger sister. He wants to kill him when he gets refused, but Henry shows him the way of the killer and they go on a bit of a spree. They kill a motorist and then film the murder of an entire family. This run of scenes, much like many of the confessions of both men, are unproven. The atrocities they commit are similar to many of the things the two men claimed, with Otis often saying he would ride along with Henry for over a hundred of his kills. In fact, many of the kills Otis would attribute to a cult called the Hands of Death, but they never claimed to film anything and many of the kills couldn't have been done by the men based on having to be hundreds of miles away at the same time. This is also the only scene in the film that alludes to Otis's homosexuality, but the real Otis says he knew as young as 10 years old. Film Otis is a drug dealer and works at a gas station, but the real-life killer worked his entire life as a prostitute. Otis and Henry begin to fight over Henry being calm and Otis having a bloodlust after some of the murders. They part ways and Henry has a nice conversation with Becky about traveling home with her. Otis is passed out drunk, and Becky makes a move on the obviously uncomfortable Henry before Otis interrupts and Henry goes out for some cigarettes. Henry seriously contemplates killing a woman walking alone with her dog before deciding to head back to the apartment. Otis becomes fully unhinged at this point and is in the middle of sexually assaulting his sister with plans on murdering her during the attack. Henry comes in and fights off Otis before being hit in the head with a bottle. Before Otis can kill Henry, however, Becky stabs him in the eye with her comb and Henry finishes him off. Henry puts Otis in the bathtub and cuts him into pieces for easier disposal. As compelling as this scene is, it's not how Otis would actually die. Otis Toole in real life would die of cirrhosis of the liver in 1996 while serving consecutive life sentences for the murders he was convicted of. The real life Otis also never tried to assault his niece Becky, whom the sister character is based off of. Henry Lucas in real life also struggled with sexual situations and his own sexuality, so the reaction to Becky could have been real except for the fact that Henry began dating the 12-year-old real-life Becky and the two ran off. The movie ends with Becky and Henry disposing of a suitcase with the remains of Otis in a nearby river before driving to a hotel for the night with plans to head with Becky to his sister's ranch. Henry says they can send for her daughter when they get settled in, and the two arrive at the motel where they seem very comfortable with each other. The next day, however, Henry drives off on his own, and he stops later down the road to drop off another piece of luggage which contains something bloody and terrible before he drives off and the movie ends. Real life Henry and Otis did in fact part ways, although Otis was still alive at the time, with Otis being captured just a bit after Henry, while Henry took the 12-year-old Becky towards California. Becky became a hassle, apparently, and eventually disappeared, but Henry admitted to killing both Becky and an 82-year-old woman that they were caring for for work. While forensic evidence was inconclusive on the spot and bodies of where Henry led the authorities, the general consensus is that he did in fact kill them both. Henry would be arrested for possession of an unlawful firearm in 1983 and would go on to claim the responsibility for over 600 murders. He would die in prison in 2001 from congestive heart failure and be buried in an unmarked grave due to vandalism. Eventually, he was convicted of only 11 murders and sentenced to death for one of them. The at the time unidentified body was known as Orange Socks because that's all she was found with. This murder is one that McNaughton recreated from crime scene photos that we see at the opening of the film. Near the end of his life, Lucas would eventually recant all of the murders except for that of his mother. While he certainly killed some people, DNA evidence proved that over 20 of his claims weren't his. While the movie may not be a perfect retelling of the life and times of the real Henry and Otis, it's a chilling and unflinching look into the depravity of a killer. To get the best commentary out there, I highly recommend watching the last drive-in episode where Joe Bob has the director on to ask questions and give his always welcome commentary. 
The movie is a mishmash of fact and fiction, but still gives us at least a glimpse of what the fuck really happened to Henry, portrait of a serial killer. 